Good afternoon and welcome to Smithsonian Gardens Let's Talk Gardens. This is a fabulous webinar series that you can learn about gardening and topics that affect gardening from specialists all over the United States as well as our own wonderful, wonderful horticulture team here at Smithsonian Gardens. And today that's who we have joining with us. My name is Cindy Brown. I'm the Manager of Education and Collections at Smithsonian Gardens. And I have a friend with me today who's going to talk to you all about pollination and what you can do to create a terrific wildlife habitat in your own garden based on what we learned at Smithsonian Gardens. And you can see by the image that's already on your screen, the images are delightful. You're going to enjoy learning about this topic and hearing more about what we're doing with James Gagliardi, the horticulture supervisor for numerous gardens here at Smithsonian Gardens. So James, oh, as always, people, please put your questions in the chat box and then we will respond to those questions at the end as many as we can. I know James likes to show pictures, so I know it's going to be a full, full uh, hour for you, but we'll answer as many questions as you have. And we're also putting a link in the chat box of his handout that is already available on our website. So James, why don't you go ahead and share and I'll disappear and come back later. Thank Thanks. you very much, Cindy. Thank you for that nice introduction. Um, I appreciate being invited out here today to speak to all of you on one of the topics that I'm passionate about, which is gardening for wildlife habitat. As Cindy mentioned, I am one of the horticulturists on staff here, so I know we have visiting lecturers. This one's from inside the house. So I've been on staff for 11 years, and I started as the lead horticulturist at the Natural History Museum and now supervise various gardens. I did well with plants, so they put me in charge of people. But today we're going to be talking about the plants and some of the work that I did at the very beginning of my career here at Smithsonian Gardens, uh, working around the Natural History Museum. So as you can see from the title of our presentation here, we're talking about creating beautiful landscapes because we want to enjoy this as much as we want nature to enjoy our landscapes. And we're gonna have a focus on both habitat for pollinators and other wildlife, mainly birds in this discussion. And I want you to notice too, we're talking about examples that we're doing at Smithsonian Gardens, and we're talking about how you can bring these to your front yard because this garden style is nothing that should be banished to the backyard. So after this presentation, you'll be able to go to your spouse, you'll be able to go to your HOA and talk about how beautiful native plants can be, how great they are for the environment and for wildlife and have that justification of why you're gonna take your lawn out in the front yard of your townhouse or anywhere else and install some of these great plants to help support wildlife. Uh, throughout this presentation, as Cindy said, I take a lot of pictures while I work and we're going to see all the beautiful full photography in here is pictures that I have taken. Um, so they're plants that I have experienced myself. Um, in addition to that, as mentioned, there is a link that was put in the chat and it's on the website for a handout. Uh, whenever I put up a plant picture from here on forward, it's going to have the Latin name on the screen, but that handout also has it available. There'll be a recording available in the future, but also if I move too quickly on any of the plants, that entire list is available to you if you want to click that link now or if you want to download it in the future. Get back on screen here. Uh, so as I said, I am a staff member at Smithsonian Gardens. I hope many of you who are joining us on the call today have visited us often and know that uh, we are the gardens across the National Mall, extending the Smithsonian experience from the inside of the museums to the exterior with thematic gardens. Uh, here, everything in green is uh, what we operate on the National Mall. And what I'll be focusing on today uh, is the work that we have done at the Natural History Museum, both adding the pollinator garden and the urban bird garden to extend that natural history um, lesson that's going on inside of the museum, but also 
the sustainability efforts and other objects that are part of our mission at Smithsonian Gardens. And what are we doing at Smithsonian Gardens? We're creating aesthetically beautiful displays. Now, aesthetics, that's all up to your interpretation. Uh, here is a non-native planting display that I created at the Natural History Museum. You should agree that it's beautiful, but that's your own decision based on the colors, the textures, the design that you want. But we want to create something for people to enjoy. We're trying to engage people with plants in our garden. So you, when you look at a museum like the Natural History Museum, about 7 million people visiting that annually. And we have that great audience that's going inside there and we want them to stop and do what these people are doing, which is looking at the plants, enjoying the garden and taking that all in. But we have to compete with the T-Rex, the Hope Diamond and everything else. So making sure that we have those educational lessons, but also those attractive elements in our gardens. And then, as I mentioned, our main theme today is creating that wildlife habitat. So here's our happy birds hanging out, and we'll talk about this plant and those birds a little bit more in the future of this presentation, but make sure it's a welcoming environment for everyone. So if you were to visit our gardens um, and you came over the past, let's see, 95, so we're talking nearly 30 years now, um, Along the east side of the Natural History Museum in 1995, it was established as the Butterfly Habitat Garden. And it was very successful, it did well, it had this strong appeal to it. And the theme that was going through there was talking about nectar plants and host plants. So the nectar plants that would provide the food source to the butterflies and then the host plants that provide the food source to the caterpillars, of course. But looking at this message, there was so much more to talk about. So on the left side of the screen here, you do have uh, false blue indigo, Baptisia australis. All the plants that we're gonna see from here forward are native plants. And when I mention native, I'm talking about North American native plants. So not necessarily DC, mid-Atlantic, uh, we have 150 people in this virtual room right now, and you're from all across the country. So we're not particularly focused on one native region in this talk. So you look at that Baptisia australis doing beautiful in there, going into bloom, but that center picture, that tiny dot on the leaf, that's because it's a host plant. It's a host plant for the dusky indigo. And uh, the picture I had shown before was the milkweed, and most people think about monarchs and the attachment to that. But there's a broad variety of plants that need to be in the gardens to provide food sources for a different variety of caterpillars. But moving on, we don't just want to focus on the butterfly garden. And that's why we changed our name, uh, as we'll see in the next few slides, to talk about a broader amount of pollinators. And here on the right side of the screen, you see our Asclepius tuberosa butterfly weed attracting some honeybees as pollinators. So this is what we did. In 2016, we rebranded that garden that was built in 1995 as the butterfly habitat garden into the pollinator garden. So we have now this broader discussion of various pollinators. Uh, talking about butterflies is often the linchpin. It gets people in, it's a little bit more exciting, sometimes more pretty, but the attendance that we have, like I said, there's 7 million people going into this museum on a yearly basis, is that we can talk about more in-depth topics in pollinators as a whole. So this is our past director, Barbara Faust, and myself, doing the unveiling for our pollination investigation, the rebranding of the butterfly habitat garden into the Smithsonian Pollinator Garden in 2016. And the pollination investigation is the exhibit that now runs through this garden space. It talks about the importance of pollination as a whole. This is the welcome panel here where you can read that 90% of flowering plants rely on 200,000 different species of pollinators. So not just butterflies, we're talking about many, many different pollinator species that all contribute back to 
um, pollination and the continuation of plant life. And the exhibit was installed and it was successful and wonderful. So here we are opening weekend, always good to see the engagement of children, to see the engagement of families that are now learning these broader lessons. The pollination investigation takes you through the who, what, when, where, why, and how of pollination, really focusing on that who. Uh, within the story, so when, talking about when does pollination happen, we need to think about pollination in the garden through entire season. So here we are in spring. Some of you are just starting to see your first flowers. Some are deep into spring, depending on how north you are in the US right now. But and anytime we see these little brooms come out in spring and even winter, sometimes the pollinators are waking up for a warm temperature. So we need to have blossoms that are stretching the entire season. And of course, in summer, when our gardens are full, there's tons of activity going on, but we also need late blooming plants to make sure that when species are fueling up for the winter, when they're going into their hibernation or switching into another life cycle, that they have food sources available to them. And then in winter, we need to make sure that we're leaving plants alone, that we have the sheltering available for them so that they can survive and that they're in there and that we don't compost everybody and get rid of them in our garden. We want them to stick around. We want a happy, diverse, mixed habitat throughout our gardens. So here is our central runway in the pollinator garden, once again, enclosing you really rich, really full, that uh, family walking through in summer. If you step through that same space uh, just maybe a few weeks ago, a few months ago, you would see something that looks more like this. And uh, if you go on from one of our past Let's Talk Gardens, I did a winter gardening lecture and I really focus on picking up the beauty and depth. I find this to be an amazingly stunning, beautiful walkway that I would want to walk through with all the different colors, the textures of stems that are going on in the winter. But there's much more important things going on in this area as well, too, beyond aesthetics. And then we have those bridge seasons. So another pathway that runs through the pollinator garden. Uh, probably at this time, maybe a few weeks from now, is when it will look a little bit more like the left of the screen. You have that beautiful red bud blooming in the top. Some of the ground covers, those ephemerals that want to come out in this wooded area um, very early in the season uh, before the leaves shade out. And you can see that foliage uh, fully extended on the other side of the screen where we start to get those fall tones in. So thinking about how the garden transitions, the diversity that's gonna bring the beauty, but also enrich the lives of the wildlife that will habitate in our city garden and any area that these gardens are planted. So it's very important to have a diverse tapestry of plants in the garden. And we're adjacent when you look out on the National Mall. I don't consider that a monoculture. It's a biculture far and wide for when you go and look out what's there. It's mainly turf grass and American elm trees. Uh, it does serve a function. It's a great place for meetings and other things to go on uh, within our great country here. But when you step over to the smaller area that is our pollinator garden, which runs slightly longer than a football field and is not quite as wide, it's only about 40 feet across, there's over 230 different varieties of plants in there. And when you think about what's contributing more to wildlife and you have this large expanse of the National Mall without great diversity on it, and then you move over to the smaller expanse that has a lot of diversity within the plantings, one of those is contributing more and it's our pollinator garden. And when you think about plant diversity and we had talked about seasonal change just a moment ago, you wanna think about blossoms that are gonna be out for these different seasons. So here's just a small example of that, our columbine, which is blooming now. Um, blooming now for some of us and blooming in the future very soon for some others. Uh, 
then more towards summer, a plant like garden phlox, and then our native witch hazel, which would bloom sort of in that late fall time. Um, and that there's pollinators active in all these. And each of these native plants has gone through an evolution process that involves when it's blooming, the type of pollinators that are available. So our native plants are all in tone with each other in an environment that's going around with it. So we wanna make sure that we have this diversity incorporated with the gardens that we plant. And we can think about how those plants change through the season. So going back to a plant that we saw earlier, our common milkweed, we have it in bloom on the side of the screen here. And a lot of people don't recognize or appreciate the beauty of the blooms that come here. And this goes into bloom around the 4th of July for us. So I always associate it when the fireworks are exploding out here on our national mall, we also have these bursts of flowers going on. And then everybody knows that this is the food source for the monarchs. We have that great caterpillar striking a pose, um, taking a break from eating the foliage. But there's more beauty and recognition that we can have with this plant. So when I did my previous talk, on winter interest and really selling what I said, that beauty and death. And you wanna notice the life and the change that's happening in the garden. So I give off this talk of having this romantic feel of the seed pods breaking open. And then as you can see in that last shot, the slowly unfurling, uh, seeds in there that are going to go off individually, float in the air, go out to the National Mall, maybe to the sculpture garden of the National Gallery of Art across from us to your neighbor's yard. So that romanticism of the life cycle of plants and just enjoying that and making sure that we maintain these plants in our gardens so that we can both see that and also the plant is able to live out its full life cycle here. And it works. So here we are, middle of winter in the pollinator garden, a family that has traveled to visit DC. And once again, there's a T-Rex, there's the Hope Diamond, Julia Child's Kitchen, the next block down. But this family stopped and they turned into the garden and they took a pause there and they're taking pictures there. And if this was a landscape where we had removed all of the plants that we have, and it was just barren, I don't think that this family would have turned in at this point to enjoy the landscape, to engage with it, even though it is the most harsh and cold time of winter. Um, as I said, with our pollination investigation, a strong part of the interpretation that we have through this garden, and I'll talk about at the end of this presentation, how we're actually sharing this interpretation and you can access it for your own use um, or for schools or other um, nature centers as well, is talking about who pollinates that. For a long time, our discussion was just about butterflies in this garden, but now we talk about multiple pollinators. And we talk about how different plants and different pollinators evolved at different times together so that there's all these various syndromes that are why the plants attach to various pollinators and why we cannot just attend to having one type of flower or inviting one type of pollinator to our garden. And we broke this down into something that we call their favorite flowers. And there's different associations with pollinators and plants based on flower color, whether nectar guides are present. So we have that graphic on the side that bees see UV patterns um, hidden in flowers, odor, um, the presence of nectar, the presence of pollen, and the flower shape, these all have to do with how different pollinators have evolved to interact with these flowers. And we have now seven different panels to talk about these different pollinators. So we still have that conversation of butterflies, but we also talk about bees. We talk about beetles, one of the first pollinators. So the graphic panel there is showing a magnolia bloom. Bees, uh, beetles and magnolias are some of our more prehistoric insects as well as some of our more prehistoric plants. So those two are associated together for pollination. When magnolias first existed, there were no butterflies around. So there's no 
flower shape and design to them that involves the butterfly landing on it, unfurling its proboscis and sipping the nectar from it and catching a little bit of pollen to move from the next. Uh, beetles are referred to as soil and mass pollinators. They fly into that big cup shape of a magnolia and they want to chew down on some of the pollen for themselves, but also get covered in it. And they just sort of flop around and make a nest. It's very um, much more prehistoric, much less romantic than the story of the butterfly, but very much an important topic to bring out. We also discuss flies. We discuss moths separately from butterflies, much different functions that are happening with a night activated pollinator. Um, those are looking for white flowers because they're reflecting moonlight. Um, so they will really shine out at the nighttime. They're often highly fragrant when you think about your four o'clocks or moonflowers or anything like that, moving past these white flowers at night, maybe by your back door or front door, and you smell that high fragrance because those are the attraction ways that they use um, in the evening. Uh, we also talk about hummingbirds and we talk about the wind and water as pollinators and an aside for bats as well too. So as I said, flower function, the flower shape is very different and diverse. And when you look at these two flowers that I have on the screen here, on the right left side, uh, we're looking at cardinal flower and you have that red flower. So that's something that's we're talking about attracting butterflies here. And it has that deep tube in it and nectar at the base. And you can see the top, that little gray part is where the pollen's gonna hit the top of the butterfly's head as it gracefully lands on those petals and sips out of it. And then on the other side here, we have our pawpaw, a native fruit for us that looks near tropical. Um, the coloration on that, a little bit of a more dusky color. It, this is a fly pollinated um, plant. So what the flower is actually doing is mimicking rotting meat. It has a flesh tone to it and a scent that might not be quite as appealing to some of us that smell it, but it's gonna draw in flies to pollinate this so that it can have a fruit set. And here that is explaining it on the side panel. We're talking about our flies. So what type of color in a plant are they interested in? Pale and dusky, purple, um, frequently with translucent patches, stuff that represents, like I said, this one is supposed to look a little bit more meat-like. There's other plants that smell quite bad too. Uh, maybe you've seen a really bad smelling viburnum that has um, fur-like texture to it. So those are also mimicking um, animals in a way to attract these flies as pollinators. Nectar guides, they don't see them, so they're absent. Um, our odor, we just put as putrid there, um, something not appealing. We know where the flies go, our trash cans. Um, nectar is usually absent and pollen, there is a modest amount because it's what they're attracted to. So we want to engage people into this investigation. We have these panels running through our gardens. We'll do children's programs and the program that we release nationally um, with the pollination investigation to really get in there, inspect how these flowers look and think about the interactions that they'll have with different pollinators. Um, so just another example of two very, very different shapes and styles uh, between this native hibiscus and our button bush and the activity that would go on uh, between those two flower shapes. Uh, so we talked about the need for plant diversity for different pollinators, but it's not that every one plant is associated with one pollinator. Of course, there's great generalists that go across the board. And there was a study done, and this was one of the most popular plants for pollinators. So we'll look at that study in a second from Penn State, where, uh, you know, some nice students sat out in a field there, and they looked at the diversity of pollinators that approached a plant and the amount of pollinators as well, too. So in that field trial study, and there's a link in the handout, and I believe we'll be posting a link 
in the chat as well, uh, they looked at what the best plants for pollinators were. So if you had just a small patch and you can't get in that diversity that we have of 230 plants in our gardens, uh, these are some of the peaks that are going to bring in the most pollinators, starting with that clustered mountain mint, uh, goldenrod, laatris, milkweed, coreopsis, uh, the ubitorium, that Joe Pieweed family, and Onothera sundrops were all in the top for that study when they performed it. And then when they talked about the sheer number of pollinators, so how many visited within a two minute time, there was some repeat within that list too. So you have that clustered mountain mint again, it's adding rattlesnake master, it's adding Mithar Menarda, so our bee bomb to that list, Coreopsis laatris, you see repeating again, and Aster as well, had a good diversity of insects. So here's one of those plants that was brought up in the Eupatorium family, bone set here, um, feeding various uh, different butterflies and bees all drawn to this more late season plant where they're able to build up that stock in the late summer. But we don't just wanna talk about pollinators, we wanna talk about attracting all of wildlife. And one of the other big ones, when you think about gardening, you think about gardening for pollinators, you think about bird gardening as well too. And the functions that a garden serves for birds, which is creating shelter space, creating food space, a place for them to raise their young as well too. Here is a catbird, right? Catbird Mockingbird. I think this one's a catbird. Um, and it's given me this nice look. It's hanging out in our spice bush, a wonderful native plant. It's a host plant to the spice bush swallowtail. It's uh, culturally significant, a replacement for nutmeg in colonial times, which is where it gets that spice name from. But this bird's staring at me, and what it did the next moment was take a little turn and take that berry off of it. And it, spice bush should be turning bright red fruits, but this bird was impatient and couldn't even wait to eat that tasty berry from this tree. Great thing, because it supports the bird, but there's a few ways that we can look to style our gardens and support birds as well too. So let's look at another plant, which is red choke berry, Aronia arbutifolia. So there's many different ways that this plant serves the community for pollinators, for birds, for our own beauty. And it really carries interest throughout the seasons. Uh, once again, native plants can be strong basis for a garden that they have this beauty with it. So if you go out a few weeks from now, you're going to see these white flowers on it get stunning fall foliage on it, and then this great berry set. And the interesting thing about these fruits are they're highly astringent. They're not exactly the most tasty to birds, and they're not exactly the highest nutritional value, which makes them less appealing. So that bird that stole the fruit off the spice bush before it was even ripe with the red choke berry, these fruits are going to last a long time. One, because they need the cold treatment to mature to even make them near palatable. Um, and the other reason being that they're not the highest priority, but they serve a very important significance in the landscape, which is that as we progress through the winter and other fruits disappear, or we have a heavy snow cover, what is going to be remaining for those birds when you reach January and February, and they may be out of other food sources, are these fruits. So that serves a very strong purpose within the diet of the birds, but it also gives us a great advantage because it means these fruits are going to stick around in the garden for us to enjoy for an entirety of the winter season. And this was uh, the background of my screen for all of winter because I think it's a gorgeous shot and I just switched over to this lovely caterpillar because we're feeling a bit more springy now. So thinking about our native plants and how we progress through the seasons and the appeal that they have in the landscape, we look at something like our native dogwood. We want to plant the native, the Cornus Florida or your regional natives compared to the Cornus Cusa 
the Asian variety because of what we see in the center here, which is the fruit set. When you look at that first screen, um, the white bracts attracting to those small central flowers, which have that dusky yellow color in, the white bracts are like a poinsettia, they're attracting the pollinator in to go towards that small central flower, which then gives us those red fruit on it, which are something that wildlife in our region will eat compared to the Asian species that gets those hanging balls, the cornus cusa, is not something that's attractive or part of the diet for our native species. But then you also get beyond the flowers, beyond what can be attractive fruit, great foliage from it. So a wonderful plant to incorporate into our landscape. And here uh, I'm bringing in a cultivar, it's called Jean's Appalachian Snow. There's a lot of plant development that came out of University of, or University of Tennessee um, at, for the plant breeding of dogwoods for powdery mildew resistance and anthracnose resistance, uh, which uh, had attacked some of the roots, which has been very successful in our gardens where we have high humidity. We're not seeing um, some of the drawbacks of powdery mildew or other issues on these plants and making them stronger uh, native representations in our gardens. Uh, some of the plants that don't get as much attention as I think they deserve, another uh, great native of ours is the silky dogwood. So once again, talking about those multiple seasons where here you're getting beautiful white flowers, the purple fruit there set after the pollinators come through. And then in winter, this attractive red stems that you can cut inside, you can use for arrangements and uh, your holiday displays, but also simply enjoy in the garden. Uh, fruit set, as we said, can be a very aesthetically beautiful thing for us, as well as important to all the critters that want to eat those fruits. And when we're designing a garden, we're not restricted to just red berries. So here we have our deciduous winterberry holly, um, Ilex verticillata and the cultivar on the side being red Sprite, but maybe you're not into red tones in your garden, it's not your color. So there's other options to look into, which is winter gold, uh, which has these great orange berries on it too, because maybe you're more of an orange and purple person than a red and green for the holidays. And speaking of purple, Kelly Carpa Americana, our American beauty berry has these amazing uh, purple berries on it and great for display. Often in the gardens, you're gonna see more of the Asian variety incorporated in, but the American variety stands toe to toe with it. I would suggest you try to find that. On the side here, you can see what our pollinators are doing. So in the center, you have that pollinator active on the bloom that's going now. The flower right before it, you can see was passed and it's getting ready for that berry set. And the flower in the future isn't quite ready to be, bloom, to be pollinated yet part of that cycle going through. Uh, I'll take a step back here too to mention uh, these are in our gardens at Natural History. It was the first time I had planted this plant. I put in five of them when we planted it um, probably around 2014, 2016 or so, and all five of them died. I have no idea why. I have a bachelor's, I have a master's degree in horticulture. We put in new soil, new irrigation, and every one of the plants I killed. We all have times that we're gonna not be successful. But I tried again, I wanted these plants, I put the same plants in and they're thriving, they're doing great. So it's been said, you really don't know a plant until you kill it three times. This one I killed once, but I killed five of them. So maybe I really know it well, but I know in the least that I really enjoy it. The pollinators enjoy it, birds enjoy it, um, our, pest control person. She even tried making a jelly out of this. It took a lot of sugars to go into it to make it palatable, but it did have an awesome color and with enough sugar was tasty. Another plant that we've incorporated into our garden, uh, Juniperus virginiana, so uh, eastern red cedar. 
And when I did a cultivar selection for this one, I chose Cantarii because it's a heavily fruited species. As we were looking to supply this as a food source for birds, it seemed to be a good choice. They're doing very well in the landscape. They have great color to them, quite attractive. Uh, when looking for options, we talked about using uh, the native beauty berry instead of the Asian variety. There's other ways where you can look towards natives for some of the plants that you may have been incorporating in your garden. So Solomon seal is a common uh, sort of mid-height ground cover in a lot of people's gardens under trees. There is false Solomon seal, which is our native plant here. So instead of having those flowers born along the stem, it's born at the end in this little puff that you can see going out to uh, this view of white flowers in the lower corner. And then it gets these interesting fruit on it. I have to say, if, once again, this is sort of a romanticized picture of it, post rain, they look beautiful. Most of the public walking by is not gonna notice these compared to the holly berries or anything else, very low to the ground, very small. But you at home as a gardener are somebody that can get up close and really enjoy these as the season changes. And then there's some things when I was even doing my research for what we wanted to do for the installation of the bird garden that I always knew honeysuckle to be a great food source for hummingbirds, but never really considered what happens after that pollination happens. And it has kind of a cool fruit set. You look at those four berries sitting out there on top of those leaves that then could be a food source moving on. Uh, but beyond food, like I said, we want to think about shelter that we're providing for birds. So here's one of my favorite plants that we incorporated into the bird garden, that black haw viburnum. And that center flower, when you look behind it, you can see a little bit of that nest hiding behind there. And then in this picture, you on the other side, you can see the American robin nest. And what's interesting when you really look at this plant closely, too, is those spikes that are there. So when we put in the bird garden, we put labels on the plants that said, is it a food source? Is it a shelter source? This one's labeled as both. Um, and it's good when these birds read the labels so that they know this is a wonderful shelter source for them. And the reason for that is the structure of this tree, this shrub, that it has these, these tight branches, but also those spikes just create a protective layer to keep predators out from them. So it's a happy little habitat that you'll find out there. So I hope you've been enjoying the beautiful pictures of plants. And I know the other thing that all of us love as gardeners is the before and after. So I talked about how we had taken a space that was called the butterfly garden and reinterpreted it into the pollinator garden. Another thing that we've done over the past decade at the Natural History Museum is taken two sides of the museum that were not servicing um, both nature and aesthetic, but also wildlife, and change those into an interpretive display um, called the urban bird habitat. So you look at the side of the screen there, that tree sitting there in a turf panel. We have some other small shrubs in the background, a layer of ferns under them, but really not a whole bunch going on here. And you look at that same tree now. So you can see the tree comparison to first shot before I got to the natural history landscape and second shot what happened after working with our team with our donors and everybody else to create a truly great exhibit and this is what I consider a complete botanical garden exhibit because it has a theme to it it has a purpose that it is serving but additionally, it has interpretation to it. And then when you look down in that lower corner, you can see some of those black labels as gardeners. We all know one of the important things and why I gave you that list of plants is because we want to know what it is and what we're talking about. So it's labeled. Uh, here's another view of that tree looking from the other side in the the background here is the American History Museum. So we have a family that's traveling 
from perhaps seeing the Batmobile to go in to see the T-Rex. And that small child has stopped and turned to look into this landscape now and is reading an interpretive panel. That is something that would have not happened with that original uh, turf and tree installation. So we are reaching a public with this message as well as reaching those birds that are finding this landscape to hang out in, to dine in, and to raise their young in. Uh, a few of the plants that we added to the landscape here. So you can see that last image that we gave had a fairly solid overstory of uh, older American elm trees. So what I wanted to do was incorporate a great garden below it that would have an understory planting. And going back to that thought of having an understory is usually going to lean towards ephemerals. Uh, so putting in our native Virginia bluebells and one of my favorite plants from growing up in Connecticut, bloodroot, and they have been doing quite well in the city. And it has to do with how we tended and installed this garden, which is putting in a fresh layer of 50% topsoil and compost and also adding an irrigation system and that would be able to keep everything moist in our warm city environment. And then stylistically looking at when I was designing this garden space and certainly we want to highlight the native plants that we're using in there, but we also want to think about our design elements. And when I designed the space, I decided being a bit more of a darker understory, the colors that I wanted to bring in were white and blue. And that's the palette that I worked with through here. And another one of my absolute favorite, this woodland phlox called Blue Moon, which uh, you can see in small little clumps, probably it was in its second or third year here, is now a complete mat that just runs through there. It helps with our weed suppression, but also sends up these stunning blue flowers that are leading this trail to the dogwood that's planted there. And then uh, once the flower and bloom has passed, they the, stake, the sticks that come up from it sort of dry out. You just have this great little mat of foliage on the base that is really easy to work with in a garden environment. Uh, I had shown columbine earlier, our Eastern columbine, which has that yellow and orange color to it. And what I had said here is that I wanted to work with a blue and white palette. So I borrowed from more of the West Coast going with a Colorado blue columbine and a mix called songbird mix that has these blues and purple tones. Uh, that flowers are a little bit more upright. They're more showy. So it was a great way to highlight design within this garden. And we still have plenty of our native Eastern columbine around. But in this space, this is what I chose um, for the design. Uh, another design choice that we had here was the addition of our wild geranium and that there is a cultivar of it called Espresso. So it has this purple foliage in, which was able to add to my color palette that I was looking for that woodland area to have a little bit more. A uh, superb plant that I hadn't experienced in the past, but then incorporated into this garden was a native uh, sedum. So woodland sedum, a native shade sedum, which is absolutely stunning. Uh, great, once again, for weed suppression, for taking an area, can handle some moisture, can handle a little bit of dryness as well, too. And in spring, gets these wonderful white flowers that sort of raise up against its mat of foliage. And when I talked about maybe some other plants not drawing an audience in or having the attention to it, I have actually seen the public stop in the garden and turn in to look at this particular plant in the landscape because it really does pop at that time of year. Uh, but we don't just want to think about spring uh, when we're talking about understory. So there are a few native plants two that we're able to incorporate into the landscape that bring out our bloom period and also serve a purpose. So we have two types of woodland sunflowers in here, Helianthus stromus and Helianthus darbidicus, uh, both really great 
for multiple reasons. One, because they go in a woodland area, so they're able to handle shade, but they're bringing in uh, blooms in the fall, which we don't as often see from our plants that go in the woodland. The height of them, they get to a very nice height. Uh, and being in that helianthus sunflower family, they're a great food source for the birds as well too. So once again, just piling on multiple interests. And what I can point out from that last picture that I showed of the woodland stone crop, when you look in the foreground there, right in front of that bird is where those sunflowers are coming up and out, and then they'll eventually get to about three to four feet in height. So you have all these whites and blues, the spring ephemerals going on, and then you have that plant weighing in weight so that it can come out and serve its purpose later in the season. So some more fun before and afters. This is up against the parking lot in natural history. And for consistency, you can look at where that handicapped parking sign is. So once again, we set out to make sure that we're giving the best environment that we could to the plant. So this had long been a little bit of a wasteland on the side of a parking lot. So the soil wasn't the highest quality. So we made sure to do some amendments with some compost in there, give the best benefit to our new starting plants, as well as make sure our irrigation system for our urban environment was up and doing well. And then you can look at that final picture of what the landscape looks like now. So much more impactful, much more beautiful for us to look out at. Um, once again, moving through the seasons here. So this is probably earlier summer where you can see different plants like the lobelia that we talked about, the flower shape um, out there. Um, some of the um, more yellow daisy-like flowers in bloom there as well too. And then large patches that haven't gone into bloom yet, which are the asters in the foreground and also the solidago. And then some plants like penstemon, which are the purple stems rising up with the seed heads that are already past. So we have this transition that's going for the wildlife, but also we have this transition built in for us to keep our aesthetic interest on what's going on in the garden. And there we moved till fall. So you can see the asters hadn't bloomed yet. And now we have a transitional piece where the asters are in full bloom. The Amsonia has turned to a rich golden color. We have seed heads out of grasses and different flowers. So this whole change, and it's just giving you all those fall feels that I know you want at the end of winter, you wanna start feeling like fall. Now we're focused on spring now, but when you're planting too, and planting is best done in spring or fall usually, you wanna think about how is this gonna go throughout the whole season? So just try to get away from always visiting the garden center and saying, oh, this is the most beautiful in bloom. This is what I wanna take home now and think about the plant next to it that may just be a small rosette of leaves because those two may be good together because the bloom on the one that's flowering now is probably going to pass and you're gonna need something next to it um, to really enrich that landscape. Uh, just some more wonderful before and after. So we're in the month of April here, you look at that side screen and um, in the first shot, we have our hell strip. So the wonderful, difficult area to work with between the roadway and the sidewalk. That's that spot that's gonna get all the road salts, that gets traffic on it, everything else. And ours is a full city block long in the bird garden, 475 feet long. And we went in there and we just filled it with an, uh, perennial native plants. And the view on the other side is really where you want to be more, much more engaged. And those two people that are walking up the pathway, they just cross the street from everybody's favorite building in April, which is the IRS. And they're in a much different landscape. They have much better vibe going on. And uh, it's a wonderful place to be. Here's the side shot for it. Once again, we have the Natural History Museum on the side, but that centerpiece looking towards the IRS never has the IRS looked better than with this wonderful scrim of native plants in it, uh, diverse ones that carry through the season, um, that do well in our climate, that can handle 
the harsh conditions of this hell strip zone. So some of the plants that we featured in there, uh, I know I'm getting close to 10 minutes, so I think left, we're gonna do our last five minutes and then have some questions at the end is um, beautiful echinacea. And then you can see the change over to asters and fall foliage going through there. And what we wanna see with a plant like the echinacea, the cone flower that we're planting in there is leaving the seeds heads in, having this path that this plant is gonna take in the landscape where the goldfinches actually come in. I have walked down that sidewalk before, and this is something that never would have happened without that landscape being there. And just a group of goldfinches fly out of this planting of cone flower. So we wanna see that seed head remain there. And then we wanna see those seeds disappear because the birds are using them as a food source. Uh, the side here shows blue star Amsonia, which is in bloom, and you can hardly notice the flowers, but really that tender, um, soft to the touch gold foliage is absolutely spectacular in the fall, and probably one of the more aesthetic reasons to plant it. And when you have those echinacea seed heads up against it, it just adds to those elements that color that texture in the garden. Uh, some of the other plants that we put in there, like I said, goldenrod, which was a top rated for pollinators, uh, mixing it with pink mooly grass. But then that grass season um, in the early spring and summer, it wasn't standing out and it could have a little bit more. So I actually went back and added a uh, liatris to it. And this liatris, the prairie blazing star, this is a very tall variety. Um, that reaches four feet, so really stands out in the landscape above the emerging grass and draws in attention and people take pictures of it and put it on our Instagram and everything else. Uh, so as I grow to go towards the end of the presentation here, uh, one thing that I did want to draw your attention to is I mentioned how we went through the process of installing the pollination investigation. And then recently we've converted this into a poster series and we were able to get a grant and distribute the 14 educational panels as a complete bilingual post poster series, English and Spanish, with uh, magnifying glasses and some worksheets that were developed by our staff as well too, to a thousand schools this past fall. Um, from that, what we gain too is a resource that we can continue to distribute and it is available digitally on our website. So if you go onto our website or a link in the chat, you can download these poster series so you can print them out for use in schools, nature centers, anybody that is nearby or just you personally, if you wanna print them out and put them up on your refrigerator, that is perfectly doable as well. Uh, so just thank you for joining me for this presentation. Uh, like we said, a lot of beautiful pictures, a lot of wonderful information. Continue to sign up for all of our wonderful Let's Talk Gardens talks. Follow us on Instagram if you enjoyed my pictures and the pictures of all our staff. There's plenty more to be found there uh, that continue to come. James, thank you. I feel like I'm back in the garden and I've missed it. As many of you know, I've been teleworking. Um, so it's always great to see the our gardens in bloom throughout the seasons in one presentation. Thank you. Well, I'm gonna, one question that I really want people to hear the answer to, and what do you do? I mean, this is a big space, kind of. I mean, you're still limited on what you can put in these gardens. Well, what kind of pollinator plants do you put in if you have a, a small garden that just has containers in it? I yeah. have an answer, but I want to hear yours first. <laughs> yes, yeah. Uh, and as I discussed, it's what you really want is a lot of diversity, but if you have a smaller landscape, you can focus on maybe you decide that you want to attract flies and that's your deal. You love those more than butterflies, those amazing insects. So you can look to culture a garden that will serve a particular area or sort of insect, but otherwise there are that list that I gave from Penn State that sort of has um, the wider draw of pollinators. So you can 
look towards trends like that. Something like the uh, Mountain Mint, which was a head on both of those. That is a tough plant. I've done it sun, I've done it shade. Uh, I know Janet in the Ripley Garden has it in a container because she's afraid of where it would creep out to other areas. So those are available. You can certainly look towards annuals too, um, which are native annuals as well as the exotics, but just so many choices and look at what you want to for design, for color. So what you're gonna enjoy the most. Yeah, I agree. Containers don't stop you from planting anything. You just need a good size container. You have to pay closer to attention to your own resources as well as the siting. Are you an eastern site? Are you full sun or you're shady? That's way more important than um, trying to figure out what... Uh, that will be your deciding uh, uh, limitations for what you're bringing in. I also say if you're going to attract pollinators, do some big masses of things. If you just have one and one and one and one, it, it's harder for them to be able to find you. Once they found you, then it's good to diversify and have lots of different types of plants. But grab them in by putting the big billboard out and then um, they'll find you. Definitely. And look towards your neighbor's yard too, if it's yeah, underused. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I certainly have. <laughs> I have a, a neighborhood watch. Um, the other thing is, it is a difficult site. And I know that we have had problems uh, with some types of pollinators coming in. Can you address that a little bit? What does Ninth Street Tunnel do to us other than making tours impossible? Yeah, so our pollinator garden on the east side of the Natural History Museum runs along Ninth Street, which goes under the mall at that point. So it's where the tunnel begins and it's four lanes of traffic. And the Ripley Garden is over 9th Street. It's part of that tunnel. It's over the top of it. And over my decade here, that was always one of the hard parts and why I really, another reason why I wanted to change the title from being the butterfly garden to the pollinator garden is the, the wind, the noise, the pollution, and everything coming off of there made it a more difficult habitat for butterflies to survive. And you would go over to the Ripley Garden and they'd be all blissfully there, but that's not the theme and they don't read the sign, although it is the sustainability, everything's the theme across the board. So um, what we've done is created a great interpretive garden that does see these varieties, but maybe not at the volume that you would see if it was more centralized or quite removed from the road. But what we do gain is that five to seven million in attendance going into that museum that we are able to do a hard sell on pollinators, on gardening styles that hopefully our national and international audience will then take home and can take home now as a poster series. Right, exactly. The poster series is absolutely beautiful. Uh, easy to download, use them in your home, use them with, when you're teaching, but they're absolutely fabulous. Um, this is a great question, and we can't recommend any nurseries, but I can recommend that if you're looking for good, rep reputable native plant growers, go to our local public gardens and uh, many of them have sales this time of the year and going into May, and they're dealing with some absolutely fabulous uh, native plant vendors. So rather than me telling you where to go, look to Master Gardeners perhaps, but also look to your public gardens and the sales that they have. I know one's coming up this weekend, so please please do yourself a favor and, and support public gardens by visiting them on their spring sales, fall sales too. Don't you agree, James? Yeah, it's 1000%. It's plant sale season. Uh, they're usually bringing in great diversity. There's some uh, public gardens that sell plants as well too, many that are focused on natives. But the other thing is to go to your reputable garden centers and just ask them if you're not seeing the plant, they might be able to get it in for you and encourage it. And not to downplay, we are starting to see more of the plants that we discussed in this conversation because of the public interest in some of the big box stores and other things like that. So start with your smaller vendors, start with your nonprofits to do them, but go everywhere and anywhere to try to find the greatest mm -hmm. plants and ask mm -hmm. for them, continue to ask for them because that's what creates the market for them as well too. And we'll get them into production so that maybe they'll start showing up in future years. 
Exactly. Um, another question that came up is how how do you print off our posters? Someone is having difficulties downloading the digital posters, and I haven't had any difficulty, but I don't know, James, if you've been asked that question before. Um, I have not yet. Um, so the poster should be downloaded as a PDF, so you can print them from your home printer, which would be a small size um, on a eight and a half by 11. And then certainly they can be printed larger from plotters or anything else. If you were looking to install them in a school, the schools may have their size, or you can try to go to a uh, printing place too as well with the files if you needed them larger. Right, yeah, and so yes, the second question was about getting them printed at a printed printing service, and that's fine. We, all those images are Smithsonian Gardens images, and uh, which means it's a CC0. Uh, we are sharing them with the public. We wanna promote pollinators to the max. So yeah. please help us do that. That would yeah. be perfectly acceptable. And, and we were so lucky to get a generous grant from the Smithsonian Women's Committee that funded the first run of posters that we did to a school list um, that we have. And we sold out sold out of free posters in three days. And they're now all across the country being used. And um, maybe in the future, there are potential for future runs. Um, yep. And I've seen some people put uh, where their uh, native plant programs and uh, sales are going on in the chat box. So that's great. Please follow. But it's one o'clock and I know we could go on talking forever because this is one of James and my favorite topics because we've worked on this so much. And we really appreciate support uh, by downloading those posters and using them and getting the word out. But remember, these are natives to our area. Please work with master gardeners or, or reputable garden centers, uh, whoever, to find the native plants that are in your area that really do help support pollinators. Yes, yes. Um, Please go out there, be an advocate for what we're talking about. Help us spread the message and say, Smithsonian Gardens does it. It's done <laughs> here. And that's why we should be able to do it in our downtown, in our uh, HOA in your front yard where you have complete control. Mm -hmm. Do it, plant it, enjoy it. Sounds great. Thanks, James. Thanks again for all your information. And we'll see the rest of you all next time. And thanks for all uh, people that are tuning in from all parts of the United States, our friends. We enjoy seeing, seeing you. I don't really see you, but we enjoy seeing your names pop up again and again. So thanks for your support. Bye-bye.